so many people remarked about the openness that you guys have all displayed on various episodes of this podcast. And do you personally think that you have a very open relationship with me and dad? Or how would you describe the type of relationship that you have with dad and I? So I want you go first. Um, to answer the question point blank, yes, definitely very open. I tell them almost everything. And that being said, I am, ex- I consider myself extremely open. I tell them anything from work to friend problems to boyfriend issues, etc. But I think that I am actually the least open <laughs> when now looking to my two right uh, are the my siblings simply because I I think I choose what I share with them and that is a lot but not every single detail which others can speak guilty. to guilty <laughs> okay now you're up why do you share stuff with us um I think that growing up we always had a very open relationship and i think one of the core things that you both instilled in all of us is you will never ever get in trouble for telling the truth if we were telling you completely upfront and honestly what we were doing where we were going who we were going with or in general like what is going on in our lives then regardless of what it was we would never be punished for that and I will always remember I had an incident with my first time drinking I drank a whole handle of vodka and I'm the oldest so that was my first rodeo and I woke up in the morning and I was petrified puke all over myself sleeping on the window bench I thought I was just toast like I thought I was dead meat I was so scared and then we all sat down in the screened in porch and they both said to me we will never punish you for something that we also did as kids and as long as you are open and honest about that pretty much opens the door wide oh yeah baby I was running with gas after that but After you guys said that, I just felt so much more at ease. Um, And my punishment that day was actually going to a lacrosse tryout, which I yacked at several times. But um, but then I looked at my other friends who would get in trouble and for drinking or for doing things we weren't allowed to. And they would immediately be grounded. They'd immediately have to stay home. They were restricted from alcohol. They were whatever. And that just kind of put a huge barrier between I think them and their parents which was just let's be sneaky let's steal let's sneak out let's go to parties and lie about where we are um when I think from very early on you both were very vocal about as long as you are honest you will not be get in trouble and I think that that just eliminated the barrier between us completely I think a lot of parents say that. I think that is every parent's throwaway line. Hey, as long as you tell me the truth, you're not going to get in trouble. As long as you call me, you're not getting in trouble. And then in the tsunami of emotions, when you get the call that your kid is blacked out or there's been a huge party or the police showed up or whatever else, most parents freak out and then ground or punish. Mm -hmm. No, I, I disagree. I disagree. For you to say that every parent out there just makes a blanket statement that says, just tell us the truth and you'll be fine. Like, no way. That that therein lies, I think, one of the secrets, the keys to the kingdom is inviting that truth telling because most people don't. Okay, right? well, that I agree. agree. I agree. I actually don't think that any of my friends, I mean, I think, I think that like, it was unspoken in a lot of my friends' households growing up that, like, if you tell us the truth, you won't get in trouble. But, like, it wasn't actually, like, there was a difference between what they were saying and what they were doing in terms of the parents. Like, the parents want you to tell the truth, but they're still going to punish you. You guys want us to tell the truth, but you're not going to punish us. Like, you actually do what you say you're going to do as parents. But did you, Mel, 
Is that what your parents told you? Cause I didn't, yeah. see, I didn't get, I didn't get that from my parents. I just got the, the idea that it takes, the message to me was it takes a long time to build trust and it takes two seconds to shatter the trust, which is sort of infers that tell the truth and you're not going to blow up relationships or leave people feeling, you know, sort of lost inside of the, the dynamic between the two of you. Like my number one goal as your parent in our relationship building was to get you to want to come and talk to me and dad about important topics instead of going to your dipshit friends. And, you know, I always thought if you're 13, 14, 15, or 16, way better to talk through something you're thinking about or worried about or, you know, wanting to try and all that stuff with adults who will listen to you than going to other 14, 15, or 16-year-olds that don't know what the hell they're doing. I agree with that. And this was like sort of going to be my whole point about like why I also have such an open relationship with my parents, arguably too open. But Definitely <laughs> too open. Um, yeah. Don't take notes for me. Um, I turned out fine, sort of. <laughs> but um, TBD. what I was going to say is you were just saying like, it's so much better for, for kids at that age to like go to their parents who will listen to them rather than their dipshit friends. But like, that's the issue is that parents don't listen. And what I was going to say, my whole point is that there's a difference between like, I think that like my <clears throat> definition of listen as like you guys have defined what listen means to me. And it's like internalizing what we're saying. Like parents all around the world can just listen to their kid be like, I really want to go to this party tonight. Like blah, 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 blah. Or like, can I please like whatever it may be? Oh, I got too drunk at this party or, oh, I slept with someone before I was ready. Like there's a difference between hearing what they're saying and actually listening and internalizing how, how it's making them feel. Like, I feel like every time we told you guys something as kids, you would actually like empathize with us and hear us and internalize it. And in doing that, you were able to like loosen the reins a little bit and let us fuck up and let us fail and let us, and Instead of being like, you're stupid, you're pu like, you're being punished, that was dumb, you were like, let's talk about it. How is it making you feel? Blah, so you're blah, blah. saying in these conversations that we were having as you were growing up, you had that sense of feeling heard yes. inside yes. of. Yes. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> My dad is bawling. That's cool. Oh, dad. Oh. I hate when you cry. I really wasn't planning on this. But, but no, totally. Yeah. Like, I feel like most kids don't talk to their parents because their parents don't hear them and don't listen to them. So why would they? I think a lot of my friends, for example, whenever they would want to go on a trip or go to a party or do anything they want to do, and they already knew in the back of their head that their parents didn't want them to or were going to say no, they go into the conversation to talk about that and express how they're feeling and as a kid I think we all come from the exact same scenario where we want to explain why we want to go to this thing or go to this trip or why we should be able to do this etc but on the other end the parents like like Kendall said may be listening but they already have an answer in the their back of their head up. their mind is made up there's no room for conversation or um changing i think that when kids go into conversations with parents who immediately make up their mind do not allow for any sort of alterations or changes to the plan then you're just set up for failure because then it just turns into sneakiness and hatred and all that resentment. stuff yeah resentment and so i don't know i think that I'm looking for a word, but, oh, I mean, I think this is also a little bit of, I mean, I think parents and children should not obviously be equal. Like there's parents need to have a little bit of authority over children. But I think what I really appreciated a most lot and a lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And, but, but I think that like, at the end of the day like I always felt as a child like you're equal and I always felt like you guys what does that mean because I know because I don't think dad and I 
ever bought into the parenting philosophy of being your friends. What, what dad and I, at least if I had to summarize the way that we think about parenting, is I think about parenting as though our job is to help you figure out who you are. Mm-hmm. And that means learning how to think through decisions, learning how to come to terms with your own values, learning the weight of the consequences of decisions, and that the whole point of parenting is for you to grow up and leave and go find somebody that you love as much as dad and I love one another and go build a family and that and to become more of who you are. And so we were always focused on connection first, correction dead last. I feel like I'm so open because you guys were so open with me. Like I feel like I could go to you guys, I could ask you guys something about your life and you'd tell me. There was nothing that you really hid from me. Maybe there was or maybe I was just so young that I didn't really ask. But you were very open, which was super nice. And I also felt like you guys had my back like 100% of the time, no matter what. Um, for example, I went to camp for a month and I got bullied. And so my mom found out about it and she like refused to let me stay there. So she took me out a week early, which felt really nice because it showed that she cared about how I was feeling and she understood that and she acted upon it, which was really helpful for me. And it showed that she has my back and she continued to show me that throughout the rest of my life. Seeking connection with you guys required us to learn how to listen It required us to learn how to hear your points of view, even though they were often stupid or immature or dangerous or irrational or emotional or irritating, but still to respect you enough to listen. And no, and oftentimes your ideas were great and we would listen and acquiesce. But the, I think you also had a sense of safety because we always had guardrails. There's nothing you're going to do that's dangerous. There's nothing we're going to allow you to do that is self-destructive or destructive to other people. There is nothing that we're going to ever allow you to do that could be a situation that is deadly or discriminatory against people. And so there were guardrails and there are guardrails that we're very, very intense about. But But I think that your guardrails are like around morals and like who we are as human beings, not behavioral. Can you give an example? Like... Be a kind person, hold the door for people, say thank you, ask the waiter's name, like those kinds of things are like unspoken guardrails, whereas I feel like other parents put up guardrails that are like no drinking on the weekends. Like you never put up guardrails that were like activities or experiences or things we do. It's how we are within those experiences are where the guardrails are. What do most parents get wrong? Like what are what are some don'ts that you've seen either dad and I do or other parents do? Um let your kids figure it out themselves yes let let their ki- like never with drinking and driving well yeah yeah obviously honestly if somebody is like gateway drugging their way into heroin or cocaine or becoming an alcoholic at a young age like i can bet you that there there is a massive lack of love and appreciation and being heard and being seen in their household and it's probably coming from their parents hate to call you guys out but it's probably it coming from their is. parents it definitely and you know what Instead of the like, yeah, you find out that they're doing cocaine. That's terrifying. You like that's I can't even imagine what that's like as a parent. But instead of seeing that and having some rash, crazy reaction about like, we're throwing all this out. We're putting you into this. We're putting you into therapy, blah, 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 blah. What I think would be more impactful is like sitting their kid down and being like, can we have it like you're not here's a punishment. You're not leaving this table until we actually talk this through because there's got to be a lot more deep-seated issues than just this bag of white powder like i'm at i think that the issue is that like parents are just so quick to be like they're so afraid of it becoming a bigger issue that they just band-aid on a bullet wound and just like put them into re- it when like the real issue is the deep-seated hurt that the kid is feeling and the love that they're not getting but i i also want to add though that like for a lot of people the parents sitting down to have that conversation if the parent is not the actual person to talk to then a licensed therapist is and so it's not 
searching the house to get rid of all the coke and the weed to make sure they don't have any because I can assure you we're smart. We can find it like mm-hmm. anywhere. So this is a question from Avery. Hi, Avery. Sa- <laughs> 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 What's that, Oakley? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Oakley's on this one. Okay. Oakley, you're young. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm mean? listening to the episode where Mel talks about her daughter's love life dilemma with Kendall. And I have Yeesh. immediate request for an episode. I have a four-year-old daughter, and I want her to feel comfortable talking to me about these kinds of issues when she's in college. So here's the pitch. How do you raise kids who share information about their lives with you? Can you give, that, can you give people a tool that you could use like, is there a takeaway? I think that the tool that you can use is a warm and excited and interested invitation to asking your ki- your kids about their life and showing genuine interest in their life. And I think that in that interest, it like makes your kids want to tell you more in an authentic way. But I also want to say that I think continuing to ask and continuing to be interested, continuing to be welcoming is very important. But if they are not like receptive, don't take that as just never asking again. I think continue to ask, continue to be interested. But there are times in life when they will not want to tell you and you need to be respectful of that. And I think it's when parents often overstep and won't stop asking and have to know that so that's a great point is that a parent can comfortably be okay with not hearing anything yes. in response yes that that, Just keep asking. that that's that the that silence does not need to be misinterpreted as deafening yes. and that there's something wrong but just that because imp- asking lets them know we're here. We want to listen. We love you. I have a question from Indre, who has a three and a half year old, and she's worried that she's going to screw up her kids by saying something or doing something wrong. And she wants to know, how do you not do that? And I just want to take a stab at this, because I think one of the things that dad and I have done well is we have screwed up. We have said things wrong, and we are not perfect, but we're really fast and good at at apologizing and taking responsibility for the things that we do wrong or the things that we realize we regret in hindsight or for um, doing things that may have hurt your feelings. I think that that's like, if you realize you're just a good person and you're doing the best that you can with whatever you got in terms of your own issues and you're quick to take responsibility for them, I think it does show that you're open and that you're human and that you're trying and I don't know. I agree. Dad, do you have Next anything question. to say about that? Yeah, I, I think that there's, I mean, transparent, <laughs> transparency is big um, and sort of leading by your own example and us being willing to share what's so about us, I think sets a, it's a good, it's, it's a good example that can only help in maybe a child wanting to do the same back towards their own parents. But it is fascinating to even in this conversation to be hearing about like things that we might think we did well or didn't do well. And you having a completely different interpretation about that uh, because you're naturally at a different age and a different, have a different perspective. And anyway, it's, it, it sort of makes me think this is all well and good. And, uh, ages and differentiation like that that's things are going to get misinterpreted along the way yeah I, another big thing indre i'm sorry if i'm saying your name wrong beautiful name by the way um is honest communication like as parents be in honest communication with each other and with your kids be in honest communication like I what just does that think- mean telling them what's going on telling them about your day um making sure like I feel like you guys were so open and honest in your communication with us and you would always tell us what was going on or why something was happening or if we asked a question you would always tell us and I like 
I think that watching you two be honest with one another like inspires us to want to be honest with you and another thing too like under the umbrella of honest communication is like I have so many vivid memories of like growing up as a family like sitting around the fireplace or sitting at dinner or sitting something like gathering like you guys made such a conscious effort whether you know it or not to gather us as a family and to just talk about literally whatever it may be with fireplace wood evergreen mint food our our love lives whatever like you made such a conscious effort to like gather us together and get us all talking and communicating with one another that like there were so many times when I was like I don't want to fucking talk to you guys for 40 minutes at the end of dinner I want to go play Polly Pockets upstairs <laughs> and chew on their clothes <laughs> but <laughs> me and but, Kendall yeah but, but then but now that I'm at my age it's like those are the memories that I cherish the most and those are the the moments that I look forward to the most which are like the con the the rabbit hole conversations we get down because I think as kids I'm tr trying to stay on track with the question but like making a conscious effort to like talk to your kid and like making it like a ritualistic thing where like you talk to them after dinner or you're talking to them in the car and like whether they like it or not or whether they're showing they don't like it at that point and maybe they won't but like I think that they'll really appreciate that in the long run because I know we all did I, I think though like under the umbrella of honest communication I think a massive part of that is vulnerability because I think watching my mom and dad grow up like literally I've seen my dad and my mom cry and break down and not be strong and tell us what's going on in their life how traumatic it is how sad how frustrating how simple it may be and absolutely like be on the ground sobbing which I think for a kid is a little bit jarring at first to witness like your most idolized person as your parent be weak but I think that watching our parents sit at the dinner table and bawl their eyes out because work didn't go well that day or because they had a hard conversation with a friend and being completely open and honest about it just essentially made that possible for all of us to do the same mm. that's really big i think when you guys talk about honest communication most adults forget that kids are truth tellers and you also are lie detectors and so when you say honest communication, what you're saying is you trusted us because what we were saying matched your felt experience. In your actions. In our actions. And I also think we tried very much to make sure that if either one of us were truly upset or frustrated or disappointed or sad, that you knew that it wasn't about you. That it was something going on in our lives that you were not to blame for negative emotions that we were feeling. Is that true? Yes. You were very outspoken about that. When like you would be in a bad mood or something you would make sure, like even like the first thing you would say, I feel like when you would come in the room is this is not about you. Like this has to do with something else. And then you would continue to be a bitch, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> We, we did do all right if the firstborn is actually saying that stuff. Normally, it would just be the thirdborn that would pick up on that. I love you guys. I love you, too. All right, here's another one. Now let's go to older kids because this is because I think most people are now like because so far the takeaway for me is seek connection because people are going to want to know the how like we're talking conceptually no, seek connection over correction is so big, so big. You will you the, will correct your kids through connecting with them. I yeah. Think. Yeah, and... I'm not a parent, but... Be vulnerable. If you want your kids to be open with you, you have to model being open with them. And that doesn't mean sharing inappropriate things, because I don't think you guys should have access to or know, like, the details about our marriage. Like, that's for Dad and I. Mm, I, thank I God. And, and so I feel like you have to model openness. You have to talk about what's going on in your life. You have to talk about yeah. your feelings. You've got to show your feelings. I think it, that you guys showing that you're that like at times you are weak shows that you're human and like makes I don't know like it gives us more space to do that too because like I like okay I'm gonna stutter for a second until I get to what I'm saying but like in being weak in crying in front of us like I think so many parents are so 
just try to look so strong and perfect in front of their kids all the time but it's like by showing your kids that like you guys are also human like allows your kids to feel those things too as they start to grow up I also think like I know so many of my friends till this day as a 23 year old they're all a lot of them have been like I've never seen my parents cry ever and I think and not saying that you need to walk downstairs and ball your eyes out every goddamn day but like I just think that not showing your true emotion to your kids is sad and not real life honestly Mm, yes and I think that hiding that away from your kids and putting on a smile every single day makes a kid feel like they can't have a bad day Mm. I also think that a lot of parents think they got to keep the stiff upper lip and they got to stay strong and they got to like be the one in charge because that's gonna make the kids feel safe and I actually think when you see your parents being human it makes you know that you can count on them to be honest with you and that you can count on them to tell you yeah what's going on it's like honest feeling and communication like yeah all right let's move on to the next question but takeaway don't be a dictator just be vulnerable yeah connection over correction let's go to christy her daughters are teenagers and they've stopped connecting with me the way they used to and they're often behind closed doors or staring at their phone and i'm envious of the connection that you have with your daughters in particular how can i get my teenage daughters to open up to me Okay, I think first and foremost, Christy, first and foremost, Christy, there's going to be days when they're going to want to be locked up in the rooms on their phone and you're just going to have to keep a smiling face on, keep, keep going, like know that it's not personal at all. They're just, they're just in that moment of, there is definitely a moment. There's a long ass moment in all of our lives, especially as teenage girls that like your friends are more important than your family. Like, that's just how it goes in your development. That's just how it happens. Sawyer and I have both felt that simultaneously. But I think, like, something that I wouldn't say my mom and my dad didn't do, but I wish they would have done more of, is, like, had more fun with us in those ages. Mm. Like, made experience happen between me, Sawyer, and my mom that, like, both Sawyer and I would have so much fun doing, like, going to paint pottery together and then going to cpk because their food fucking slaps or like (laughs) you know what i mean like going to the mall and going shopping or like girls today we're gonna go to the pumpkin patch and if you want to bring your friends bring your friends like it i think like showing that you care about your daughters and their friends but also making time for the three of you to have fun together like those memories will just be like so crystallized in their minds i think yeah i didn't do that enough i completely agree with kendall i also can say like I think that as a teenage girl I was angry (laughs) and angsty and I literally sat up in my room as soon as I got home from sports and did my homework went to bed and then went to school and on the weekends there was no time for family it was just friends and I think that that like Kendall said is honestly a phase in life and I think As they grow older, I can assure you that family does become more important, especially in college when you move away and you realize that, oh my gosh, I'm not living with them all the time. I get to go see them and that day will come. And I think that instead of just waiting for that day to come, I completely agree with Kendall in creating experiences that you know your kids will enjoy especially your daughters creating experiences that involve their hobbies their interests if they like horseback riding take them to a horseback show horseback riding show if they like shopping take them on a shopping trip to new york city um something Mm. like that like and including their friends and those plans i think like you i think you did a really good job of like I, i know i hosted a lot more than sawyer did at our house but like you were so both of you were so great about like you want to be around me but if that means that I'm not going to be present with you but I'll be outside with my friends so be it like you were so good about that and I think that's a huge thing for parents like if they want to be with their friends like and you want to be with them like letting your kids know that like your play your house and I know that not everyone's homes can accommodate like lots of friends and stuff but if you have a space where you can invite your kids to be with their friends like 
that's huge and they will keep bringing their friends back like i did here's a question from Ufe. uh as a mom of two grown daughters and a son who's still at home i feel very regretful i wish i could have done things differently and now i'm seeing my screw-ups play out in their lives and it overwhelms me and brings me to my knees and yes, I tell myself you did the best you could with what you knew, but that only gets me so far because I know in my gut I could have been doing things way differently. And yet I kept repeating the same things because I was stuck in patterns. How as parents can we find peace now that our eyes are wide open about the mistakes that we made and actually start building a bridge back to our kids again? I think this is a question for the both of you. Wait, no, I actually have an answer. I was going to say Can what you, you put your mic. I was going to say tell them. <gasps> yes. Tell your kids how you're feeling. It's never too late to like build a beautiful relationship with them. I know that like we're very lucky. I'm very lucky to be a part of the Robbins family, but like I don't think that like everybody on this podcast, everybody that's been requesting and sending in questions for my mom like tell your kids you're feeling this way that is the most important thing you can do like it is it makes them feel so much more seen when you just tell them like imagine how it would feel if you just told your kid I want to connect with you and I feel like I fucked up a little bit in the past it's incredible and I often think that the most profound advice is right in front of our face and it's true like instead of talking to your girlfriends or your spouse, go straight to your adult kids and say, like, I really regret that I didn't do more with your friends. I regret that I was not around as much as I would have liked to have been. I regret that we were struggling so badly financially that I couldn't afford to do those things. And so it does make me f sad, but it's one of the reasons why I'm like, oh, note to self, instead of trying to drag your kids closer to you if you want to be close to your kids go to them Bye. go to them where they you said hobbies Sawyer like don't make them do the shit that you like to do go do with your kids what they like to do even if you don't like their friends invite their friends to be with you because then your your child is going to want to hang with you I think also going off that the, the perfect example that I can think of is like Oakley is really into video games and used to be a gamer. A gamer. Well, he is a gamer, but like used to be no, a big gamer. He used to be a big gamer and obviously my dad is not. He doesn't play video games. <laughs> but he brought him to a video game conference and they had an amazing time and bonded and I think that that was so special because I'm very aware that my dad is not sitting with Oakley playing video games for eight hours every day but the fact no, that he that can <laughs> but the fact that he can like take you to a conference and bond with you that way even though video games is not his top of mind interest is the perfect example with diving into your kids lives mm. even into something that makes you feel uncomfortable or just know nothing about and so we can I would just like to say that I do not play video games for eight hours a day. Jesus Christ. Can you I have an image to uphold. Can but yes, no, that was honestly, please? that was honestly a really cool experience because I don't even remember like asking dad to do that with me. Cause like, I remember dad just coming up to me one day and being like, Hey, there's this thing happening involving video games. I, I, what was I think I? it's called like anime. No, it's called, I think it's got, <laughs> what was called PAX East. I think yeah, so it was PAX called PAX East. East. My dad was like, there's this thing like involving video games. You want to go? And I was like, yeah like i want to go with you like that'll be so much fun and so i remember we just like went we walked around and we like looked at all these booths and we like played games together and like it was a really cool and like fun experience and i definitely will always remember that and it was like it was to cool it was really cool seeing him take interest in my life like that like felt nice because it also made me feel like what i was doing was like okay mm. like there wasn't something wrong with what i enjoyed because like he was willing to be like well let's let's go do something about that which felt really nice at the time. Do you think a lot of parents make the mistake of forcing their kids to do things that they like instead of letting their kids be themselves? Yes. 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 I think a lot of parents, sports is a big one. I mean, I think it's, mm -hmm. sports is deaf. I'm not a parent, so I can't really speak on this, but like, I think it's like, a, there are a lot of life lessons and values in t like l making your kids play sports, but like, 
our parents made Oakley play literally every, I literally every played single every sport, single sport under the sun from gymnastics to diving to soccer to lacrosse. And like he would play every single sport for half a season. He hated every single one of them. And my parents would pull him out and be like, what do you want to try next? And he would tell them. And I, I mean, you can speak on this more because this was your experience. But I think a lot of parents like what I was going to say in general is like, I think there what you guys have mastered is like you brought us into the world not so you could live through us but so we could be our own people and you have mastered the art of like teetering between letting us be our own person and not being a fuck up and I think a lot of parents bring their kids into the world so they can live through them and in doing that make them play soccer until their bones are aching make them get straight A's because that's what they wish they would do make them do this make them do that until like they don't even know who the fuck they are by the time they're 22 and obviously they're not connected to their parents then they don't know who they are but you guys and what I think a lot of you guys listening to this podcast what I would advise you to do is like figure out how it feels for you and what it looks like for you to bring somebody into the world so they can be their own person not so you can make them be somebody that you wish you might have been mic drop that was phenomenal boom yeah, that basically was it. I want to do some rapid fire questions. Go. Okay. 18 year old college freshman hates where she is. She has a long term boyfriend who went to another college two hours away. A month before she left for college, she wanted to switch to the college her boyfriend was attending without even touring it. What do we do? Because she loved college before she went and then. As mom says, shit got real at orientation and now she wants to leave because she, quote, doesn't like college and hasn't met friends. What do you say to your kid who does not like freshman fall of college? All right. Let me just tell you something. This is the story of my life. <laughs> this is exactly what happened to me. Um, word for word, I went to Boston College I had a boyfriend at the time who went to University of Michigan. I absolute I was obsessed with it. I was so excited to go. I was proud to be an Eagle. I showed up and immediately didn't see the raw raw fraternities, sororities. I didn't have a massive friend group. I had one friend who I met at orientation and literally for the entire year she was my only friend. I was miserable. I sat in my room every single day, bawling my eyes out, begging my parents to come pick me up or Uber me 20 minutes home because I didn't want to be there. I attempted to join a bunch of clubs to try to meet people. And I tried to take all the steps in which I thought would be the best way to meet people, et cetera, make friends. And I didn't connect with literally anyone. And so what my advice is, another another part of that is I can completely relate to the high school boyfriend who is at another college. All you want to do is be with them. You just came off an amazing senior summer, you, et cetera. I'm sure you have heard this story. But my advice to you is she has to stay for a year. She... I really believe this because my entire Boston College experience for my entire freshman year was horrible. And I do have to put that out there. But I went back because I didn't know where I wanted to transfer, although I wanted to transfer. And I had the best year of my entire life, my sophomore year. And I literally think that was solely because my parents forced me to stay. They said, you need to stick it through. And I honestly grew as a person so much that entire year because I was in pain, uncomfortable, trying to meet new people, all of which brought me to the best people in the world at Boston College. Well, it also brought you to the best version of you. See, this is an example of guardrails. If you always allow your kid to bounce from a situation that makes them uncomfortable, their anxiety increases. And here's what you can do in that situation. You can say, I hear you. That is hard, and we're paying for the tuition, so you need to stick out the year, and if you are that miserable, here's what you could do. 
you can transfer. And so put all that energy into applications and figuring out where you want to go. And so you acknowledge what your child is feeling. You validate their experience so that they feel seen and heard. And then you help them come up with solutions. And, you know, one of the things that I always say to you guys, even though I know that you guys make fun of me, is do you want me to listen? Do you want to hear my advice? What do you need? And then nine times out of 10, you guys do not want advice. You just want me to listen. And then you end up going, so should I? What do I want to do? I have another question because I think that was excellent advice. Do not rescue them. Do not let them bounce because they're nervous. Make them stick it out. And then help them think of solutions, both mm. for sticking it out and also for changing the situation if that's what they want. Right, in fact, our your cousin is going through this right now. Yeah. So uh, another one. Wait, one more thing, though, also is you always said when I was complaining that I had no friends freshman year, in terms of the solutions, for an example of a solution, is my mom always used to say, well, why don't you just go knock on someone's door? Or why don't you Instagram DM to DM someone to get lunch? And at first, I always said, no, that's so weird. I'm not going to do that. Like, I have no friends, etc. But then I started to get desperate. And I started taking her advice, and it actually worked. Final question. We do not like the person that our 18-year-old is dating. On a couple of occasions, they have been rude to my husband. And ever since seeing them, she doesn't talk to us like she used to. I don't trust this person. I don't think they're a good fit for my child. What do I do? Okay. Well... Um, Sawyer, I'm going to let you meditate on this one while I take the wheel right now. Um, I, <clears throat> what do you not do? What you should not do is make your daughter or your son or your child feel as though they cannot bring the significant other over. Because I think as somebody that was in a relationship that was very healthy and loving in in high school, I watched my sister in a relationship that I know she was happy in for a while, but I think towards the end, whatever it had, it, it had, it ended for a reason. But I think one of the, re like I watched her shut down whenever we would talk about how we felt like they weren't a good fit or we felt like maybe she wasn't herself around him. And I think that the more and more you talk about how you don't like the significant other, the more and more your daughter's going to pull away. You need, she's at a phase in her life. She's with this person for a reason. If it's not love, it's a lesson. She's going to learn something from it. As long as she is safe and there's no abuse going on, telling her that she can't be with him, telling her blah, all this stuff, like it's only going to push her further away from you. And I think that like, again, honest and open communication, talk to her, tell her we love you, but we feel like you're not yourself around this person. Is there a reason why? Is there anything we can do, et cetera, et cetera. Dad, go for it. Did you, did you hear that from us? Sawyer? I heard... Because I think we said that. The question is whether you heard us say that. So the thing is, is when I was in this position and you were very open and honest, made it very clear that he is more than welcome over, you guys really enjoy him, all this stuff. And I think what I heard when you would say things along the lines of, I don't think this relationship is necessarily great for you anymore you are not yourself around him which I think is our biggest takeaway and they always phrase the conversation less about him and more about how I was and who I want to be and who I'm meant to be and he was not making that possible for whatever reason and I think that by my parents always framing the conversation and putting it back on me rather than blaming it all on my current boyfriend at the time, I it did obviously make me pull away at a bit in the moment, but I think those those conversations about how they were feeling and while they them putting it all on me eventually made me feel they always essentially they always stayed in my mind I 
wasn't actively listening, but in the back of my mind, whenever I was with him after those conversations, in the back of my mind, I would be questioning, is this right? Is this not right? I really love him. I want to be with him. He makes me feel comfortable, I, et cetera. But then in the back of my mind, I would consider, yes, but who am I? And mm. I think that that by framing the conversation towards your daughter rather than putting all the blame on the boyfriend... I think that that obviously might not make her immediately end things, but at the same time, it will stick with her forever. I can assure you that. Yeah, I I think that's a good insight. So I got two things from that. Number one, again, let's go back to one of the huge takeaways. Do not drag your kids to you. Go to them. So being super welcoming, even if you don't like the person, um, I realize the rudeness is a hard thing to deal with if that's the situation. If they're not in a dangerous situation, I think the more you can make them feel welcome at your place, do things with them, take them out to dinner, uh, the more you got eyes on them, the more you have a better handle on the situation. The second thing, and they're never going to want to hang out with you if you're super judgy. And I thought that dad and I, because I actually really liked who you're talking about. I just didn't like who you were in it because you changed. Mm. And... I think that's, you want to talk too? No, I was just, I feel like that happened to me as well. Yo, go say something. I don't know. I talk. I, I think I, I was in a relationship for about a year and a half. And it was a great relationship. It was very healthy. Um, but I, I, I would say that I was not myself around my family. Um, there was a lot of... Um, I don't know if sneakiness is the right word, but I definitely, I definitely, I wanted to, my biggest goal in that relationship was like to make sure that she was comfortable and she was happy and she, she would tend to become like uncomfortable in certain situations. Most of those situations involved being around my family. So I, whenever she'd come over, I would basically like hide her away in my room because I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable and I was going out of my way to make sure she was comfortable. And I remember I had so many conversations with you guys about how I was like different and like you, there was nothing wrong, but you just wanted to hang out with us more and you felt like you still didn't really know her. And I think throughout the whole entire relationship, like those thoughts never left my mind. Like Sora was saying, like they were always in the back. Um, I was going to say that's, thank you for sharing oh, snaps for Oakley. Thank you. Um, thank you. What I was going to say is I think, as some like I said before, as somebody that was in the opposite of that kind of relationship, me and my high school boyfriend didn't leave my parents alone. But I would witness you guys always having conversations with Sawyer, and I witnessed some of the conversations you had with Oakley, just like about the significant other and about how these two were being in that relationship. And I think like back to the whole honest communication thing, like you would always have these conversations, non judgmental conversations with both of my siblings to the point where it did like you were open and honest about how you felt and how you were noticing their behavior change. But like it was never judgmental. It was never like you need to break up with him. You need to, you need to do this to the point where like, I think it almost made them feel more comfortable talking to you about it. Cause like then when Sawyer would have issues with this guy or Oakley would have issues with his girlfriend, like he would, they would still come and talk to you because they know that you wouldn't be like, well, now's your time to break up with them. You have to break up with them. You would just be like, okay, how are you feeling? Like, do you know what I mean? I don't get the sense where you're like that with Sawyer. You were like that with Wait, me. Wait, I feel like you were whenever you, whenever I don't she know. had it's issues. So, it's like, Sawyer's, Sawyer's experience. No, I agree. I think that what, and obviously once again, I'm the oldest child, so I was the first rodeo, but I think that what happened was at first it was very, oh, well, I don't think you guys should be together. Like, I think you should break up, overpowering. And then I think they sensed that I was pulling away. And then all of a sudden they made a flip and it was constantly like, oh, well, what are your, what are you and so-and-so up to tonight? Like, you guys are more than welcome to come back over and hang out here. Like, we'd love to see him. We'd love to see you. We can cook you dinner. And I think that Unfortunately, I had already seen the first side of things, so I was already self-conscious about how they felt, etc. And like Oakley hid him away in my room every time we hung out. But I I do 
I I did really appreciate the shift in communication and understanding of where I was coming from. You did that? You created a little like hideout for her boyfriend? No, no, no. For no, no, no. Like, <laughs> saying, like, in relation to we hid in the room while they were together. <laughs> All right. One final one. And I think this is important given the rise of mental health issues okay. right now in middle schoolers. We're not sure. We're not sure why, but our 12 year old daughter is being excluded from her friend group. I often hear her crying in a room, but when I talk to her about it, she won't tell me anything. What do I do? That's a hard one. You could try relating to her, like telling her, like opening up to her first and then seeing if she'll respond like that. Because I feel like everybody has a situation in their middle school or high school days where like something shitty happens in a friend group. And I feel like if you go to her and you're like, look, I noticed that like something's going on in your friend group. Like when I was so-and-so age, like this happened to me and it may make her feel more inclined to say something. I think another thing too is when you do broach the conversation, like, even if she's like very quick to not say anything back to you, like make it very clear that like you're just there to listen and you just want to be there for her and that you're not going to do anything. Because I think a lot of middle schoolers are petrified that if I tell my mom that I'm getting bullied, she's going to go and yell at all the bullies and then I'm going to get bullied triple the amount of times I'm already getting bullied. So like make it clear to her, like I will not be, telling your teachers telling scolding anybody like I am your teammate and whatever you need me to be I will be for you but please just let me be there for you I think that last part's genius don't to promise t- yeah. you're not going to do anything promise you're not going to do anything about it just promise you're going to listen if you could tell parents listening one two three just any behavior change specifically that they could adopt today that would help them create a better relationship with their kids. What are what are something that you could do specifically that would really help? One thing, stop grounding your kids. I can assure you it does nothing but make them want to retreat and do the complete opposite of what you're telling them not to do. What should they do instead? Honestly, <laughs> honestly like have the conversation and explain why it upset you and why it made you frustrated with why they did it and I think just like happens again if it happens again then let's discuss it then and then we can talk about a punishment but the grounding thing I can assure you all my friends used to get grounded and as soon as their quote punishment or grounding ended they would go the second they were ungrounded they would go straight to the party And they would go straight to doing double the amount that they were doing before. Mm -hmm. So I can assure you, grounding, please just stop. It really, really, I've never seen it work on anyone. Um, I would say be vulnerable with your children. Um, Cry in front of them. Be sad in front of them. Be happy in front, like emote in front of them in a real authentic way, like how you would with your own friends and people your age. I think that's like, you're just showing them that you're human. Like, that's what they're trying to be too. I would definitely say just like, just be there for your kid. Like, be their backup. Always let them know that you have their back and you're going to be there to help them whenever they need it, no matter what. I think another thing that we talked about earlier is make sure that when you are with your kid and you're listening to the your kid you make it very very clear that what they say to you will go nowhere and that means not to your fiance not to your spouse not to your friend not to your dog literally anyone it is just between you two because i can assure you it feels so invalidating to tell a parent something and then either like even say I tell my mom something and then the next day my dad comes to me and asks if I'm okay about that like that doesn't feel good because I felt like I was in a trust circle with her and I just wanted her to know that 
And so I really think that making sure your kid knows that it's just going to stay between you two and then it actually does. And then you don't go on your walk with all your girlfriends the next day and explain your kid's biggest issue is seriously like crucial. I'm not going to I'm not going to butt that. Yeah. Just have your kids back like same umbrella trust if you tr- if you give your kids your trust like I-, I think just trust like trust them give them more give let out the leash a little bit and trust that like yeah they might fall but they're still on the damn leash like yank them back like you know what i mean like trust them be vulnerable with them go to them go take interest in what they're interested in don't ground them have conversations with them be honest with them like be all we're saying is just be a human being to them like you're no different now that you're a parent I mean obviously yes you are different you have a lot more responsibilities but you still are made of the same chemicals and feel the same emotions like why would you turn that off they want to see that too that's the most important thing you can do is just be a human be you how do I help my son deal with kids who say hurtful things he has a very hard time ignoring them Mm. um I mean, when people say hurtful things, we got, what like, I just like we got a lot of questions. Like you turn on. the page and I'm like, holy shit! Okay, um, <laughs> we have a lot of questions. Um, and we'll get to them all. Um, when people say hurtful things to other people, yeah, nine times out of ten, it is because they are in a world of hurt right now. Yeah, whether that be family, uh, friends, maybe academically, there's always something wrong with their life and they're taking out their frustration on somebody else. So you can know that because I believe that's true. But it still hurts Correct. when people say things. So how in the moment when somebody says your legs are weird or they call you some name or they you know, leave you out or, or something you've experienced is when you always end up being the person in a game Mm -hmm. that's it yeah so you're you're subtly getting picked on and excluded because the whole point of whatever game you're playing in phys ed or whatever it's like go after oakley yeah and you start to realize that everybody's out for you Mm -hmm. so when it's happening you can say to yourself well people are just doing this to me because they hate their life and they're getting bullied but it still sucks so how do you how do you cope with it well this is a little bit different, but one way to make it go away. Yes. I think is just to not really react to it and honestly, like make fun of it. Like be okay. Mm, How would you do this okay. with the legs? Like, How would you do this with the legs? Like agree with them. Okay. They're like, oh, your legs look stupid. And you're like, yeah, they do kind of look stupid. I know. It's funny, isn't it? And like you, you, you go into it, which makes them feel a little weird because they were expecting you to, um, be like oh my god you're like oh my goodness like this is so bad but if you joke about it with them then they're kind of like oh what like they don't really care it doesn't go anywhere it doesn't go anywhere right and then they're like oh like why why do anything to this person if they're not going to react in the way that i want them to and what would you advise the adult and that kid's life like the parent that's writing in this question how as a parent can I support you? Because I would I would expect. Right. I think as a parent, like your first thought is just like reach out to the parents and make sure like I tell them that their kid is being a horrible person. Don't do that. Never do that. Never do what? Never reach out to like the bully's parent or the school or anything. Because for a middle schooler, the last or, a, or even a high schooler, uh, the last thing that they want is for their parent to be getting involved in their social issue for for the kid to come up to them the next day, their bully to come up to them and be like, your parents just wrote mine and said I'm being rude to you. Like, you're the worst. Like, that's be all, end all horrible. But. But. There are. There are. Ex- exce- there exceptions. are exceptions. There are definitely exceptions. Exceptions when it's racist, discriminatory, when they're saying dangerous stuff, when you're yep. starting to feel depressed, when yep. you feel like yep. you can't handle it. Yes. Then you have to tell. Yes. A hundred percent. Then you have to do something. But because, you're talking about the little but I'm shit. I'm talking about the little shit. Like okay. I'm talking about the little stuff. Um, what you can do as a parent is you can be there for your kid. You can reach out. You can say, 
what can I do? You have to keep asking your kid what you can do because everybody's different. Everybody needs something different. Yep. But to show your kid that you are there for them is huge. Just like every day saying, hey, how was your day today? What can I do to support you? Things like that. You know, another thing you could do mm. is you could rehearse comebacks. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Didn't we I do that once? That. I bet we probably did. Yeah. Like, I love that. Like, what are you going to say? If you walk into that school and they do blah, 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 what are you going to say? Yeah. That's good. That's really good. Because then it also like <laughs> makes fun of it. And then they're like, oh, maybe they will pick on me today. And then I could use my comeback. And like, <laughs> oh, that is good. That is really good. Definitely okay. do that. Okay. And I'm also gathering though, that it is important to talk about this with your parents. Yes. Even if it's the little shit. Yes. Your message though to parents is don't get yourself involved in the little shit. Mm -hmm. If it starts becoming racist, dangerous, your kid is feeling uh, depressed, things like that, then... You may want to you possibly definitely reach out. Yeah. Then you, you should, should reach out to the school, reach out to the parents. You want to do something. Um, but if it's little stuff, name calling, uh, teasing, just make fun out of it, basically. Or help your kid. Or help your kid. Or figure out what your kid needs. What do teens need from their parents? Like what reminders, what role should we be playing? Yeah. Uh, the Actually, last night. Uh oh I was, what did I do? You didn't do anything. I was at my school presenting parent tips to a bunch of parents. <laughs> <laughs> and, Why were you doing that? Because I'm a senior mentor at my school, which basically means I'm assigned a group of first years who I look over and I can help with social issues or academic issues and things like that. And so I was asked by the school to come in last night and give a presentation to parents just saying, here's some tips for your new high school uh, ninth graders. So the freshmen. Freshman parents. You don't call them freshmen. What do you call them? First years. First years. Okay. And uh, while I was there after my presentation, our headmaster got up and he gave a speech. And what he said, which I will repeat to you guys, is just that when you have a kid, you are a coach. And coaches never play in the game. They can give advice and they can watch, but they cannot get on the field. I'm like blanking on what the question was, but. But so that's the role of a parent. That's the role of the parent. You can give advice. You can cheer. You can watch. Um, you can support, but you, you can never step on the field. You can't play for your kid. You're just there for them. Got it. So that's what, and, and specifically, what are some of the things that every young adult and teenager needs to hear from the adults in their life or from their parents? That you're proud of them. Okay. That's huge. Um, that you love them. That's also very big. You're there for them to support them. Um, they want to hear that you like their friends. That's really important that you, that you're friends with people that they enjoy. Um, but what if you don't like their friends? Hmm. Well, what would you do if you didn't like my friends? Um, well, I would still want to act in a way as if I did. Yep. Because I know that if you felt like I didn't like your friends or I, I was like judgmental of your friends, you wouldn't bring them around. Yeah. And if you're not here... With your friends, I don't have eyes on you and your friends. Yeah. And I don't know your friends. Yeah. And so it's important that I get a chance to know who you're hanging out with. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you and your friends feel comfortable coming over to our house. And yeah. so if I'm judgy of them, they're not going to feel comfortable coming here. Mm -hmm. If you think I don't like them, they're, they're not, not going to feel come. comfortable. And the other piece is, how could you possibly know if you like somebody if you haven't actually tried to get to know them? Yeah, definitely try and get to know your kids' friends. Yeah. Have conversations with them. Invite them. If they're spending the night, invite them to dinner with you. Like, Do all that to get to know your friends because they're a huge part of your kid's life. Actually, there's a research study that came out recently, or not even that recently, that said 97% of your child's success as a young adult, is based on the five friends they hang out with. Mm -hmm. Landmark study. And I think that's true. And so your only access point to change your child's friend group or to have an impact on them is to 
make them feel welcome so you get to know them. Yeah. Okay, so Oak, here's another question from a listener, and she writes, my daughter wants me to step back a little bit, and I would love to hear from Oakley and from you, Mel, what kind of boundaries do you guys have as a mother and a son? I mean, I think that's depending on, like, how overbearing you are, but let me think about our relationship. Like, I feel like I tell you everything whenever there is something, or if you ask, I'm just like, yeah. Like, I, I, I never feel like I have to keep things from you. Not that I'm, like, coming to you and telling you everything. But, like, I never feel like I have to keep something from you. Well, that makes me feel great that you feel like you don't have to keep something from me, Oak. If you need something, you can talk to me about it. So thank you for sharing that with me. And in terms of boundaries that I have as a mom, um, there are really kind of two categories of the boundaries. The first one is the boundaries that I establish that help keep the communication open and that create a trusting and respectful relationship between us. And the second set of boundaries are around keeping you safe. And so let me talk about the first one, which is this boundary of respect and open communication. And to that end, I really try hard to let you, Oakley, be your own person. I like that. I like that one. You know, that I have to keep reminding myself that I'm not supposed to control him. I need to guide him. You, you said on another podcast you're on that a parent should be like a coach, not somebody who's in control. And I often have to remind myself of that. Um, the second thing is your personal space. When I walk in your room, my skin crawls. <laughs> it's not that bad. Well, you know, I, I, I see the clothes everywhere. I think you're you're painting me in a bad. Let me explain my room. Okay, your room is and and you know here's the thing like it's his space. When we start to cross the line between it being dirty or there's dishes stacking up, I drop the hammer. Yeah, but which is rare. Yep. I also um, like have I feel like I'm my shower schedule is pretty concrete. It's like in the morning and then right before I go to bed. So you take two showers a day. Every day. You do. <laughs> yes. Why? Well. So the night is when I like use soap and everything and yep. like clean myself. <laughs> and then the morning is cause my hair is really like thick and curly. Yep. And so when I sleep, it's like, it's really like this, it's like a helmet. It's like a helmet when I wake up and the only way to fix it is just to like reset it by getting it wet. Oh, so I just, I literally jump in the shower for like 30 seconds and it, oh. just, it also wakes me up. Like it's, it's a win-win. I also notice you journal a lot. I do every morning, you know, I, I wake up, it's like, wait, I every like, morning. Yeah. I wake up, I get my morning routine done, which is shower and get out the door <laughs> like, <laughs> and like actively avoid you and then <laughs> get in the car, get to school. And then I like to get to school like 20 minutes before it starts. And I just sit in the car and I journal about the previous day. Or if I didn't journal like the day before, then the two days before, like it's, it's a process. I just learned something about you. Hmm. I had no idea that you journal every single day. It's great. Love to journal. Even for five minutes, like writing anything down. It's, it's amazing. When did you start that? Last year, maybe? You've been doing this for a year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would never show you my journal. That's all I'm going to say. See, that's an example, Oak, of a specific boundary that you have with me. And you would never show me your journal. That's your boundary. And because I'm trying hard not to control you, remember my value is I want to keep the communication open. I want to make sure you feel respected. I'm trying to respect you and the privacy that you have and even like kind of the fact that it's your room. And even though I really want to hunt down your journal and crack it open and read it, I'm not going to lie about that. I am going to respect your boundary, that this is your privacy. Okay, great. Um, other boundaries that I have with, with him are um, around just safety, mm. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing is I don't talk to Oak about Chris mm -mm. or my marriage mm -mm. or what's going on in my friends' lives. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay, great. Anything else you'd add? 
No, I'd say that that covers all the bases, except my room is pretty clean most of the time. So the next question is from a listener who writes, how did your parents talk about alcohol use with you? Do they allow it? Did they ground you? How did they handle it? You can speak freely, Oak. <laughs> um, well, I think from a young age, you were more practicing safe ways of using it, healthy ways of using it, like a glass of wine at dinner or like a little bit of a drink at like a party or something. Um, before any parties or anything really happened, you would talk to the three of us kids and always tell us that if we do go out and do something cause we're teenagers and stuff happens and kids do stuff. And if you're a parent listening to this and you're like, Oh, that's bad. Well, you did it too. So that's okay. Um, you always said that if we're ever going to do anything before we do it at a party or somewhere else, you want us to do it with you. Yes. So that it's like. It's we're in a safe environment. We're with people we care about. You can take care of us and it's all safe. No drinking and driving. That's your number one rule. That's my number one rule. And what's the rule to about if you're going to be at a party where you are drinking, what do you have to do? Either have a driver who my mom trusts or uh, stay at the party or final option, call mom or dad and ask for a ride. And what do we do if you tell us where you are and drinking's involved and the police show up or something happens, like, do we ground you? No. Why? You ask me to call you and, well, you don't ground me because, again, it's a natural part of life. Like, it's experimentation. Everybody experiments. And also, wait, why don't, like, because we're getting punished enough by the cops. Like, I feel like that's. That's a great question. I'll, I'll tell you why. Because here's how I've chosen to handle this issue with your dad. Because this is a deeply personal issue in terms of how you decide you're going to talk about it with your kids. And so for us, we took the time to figure out what do we value here? Because number one, every kid is going to experiment. Just every assume kid. they're going to experiment. And number two, if you assume that they're going to experiment and you can't stop that from happening, what is it that you value most? And for me, what I valued most was open communication, trust, and safety. And so I took the focus off trying to control something I couldn't control, which was whether or not you drink. And I put all of my attention on how do I navigate this as a parent through my highest value, which is creating trust with you, creating open communication with you, and keeping you safe. And safe means not only uh, no driving, safe also means your use of it. Like not being one of these kids who is, so they binge drink like crazy because they have to sneak it. And so they just chug the, because we saw this over and over and over with kids whose parents punished them when they drank or banned the alcohol or pretended it didn't happen, it created a lack of trust, it created sneakiness, it created lying, all of which led to very dangerous behavior. And so for me, I don't know whether it's the right call or the wrong call, it has been a very smart and successful call for us because it's aligned with our values. And so that's why. Now, if you lied to us, I'd punish uh, you. Yeah, I would get punished if yes. I lied. If I ever found out that you got in a car with somebody who was drinking, or you yourself got behind the wheel, would, you would lose the right to drive for a year. Yeah, that is, And that's that no is joke true. because we live in a rural area and I had a friend die in high school because of drinking and driving. And so that's why my values are that. And so I just feel like that's the formula for anything that you're navigating, whether it is sex or it is alcohol or it's drugs or it's anything. Like figure out what, you value most and be honest with yourself about what you can control and what you can't control. Because if you don't understand that if you literally, if I were to ban you and say, you're not allowed to drink, you can't drink till you're 21. It just makes you want it more. And it also makes you go, I'm not telling you what I'm doing. And so that's how we handled it. And that's why I don't punish you when you do what you say you're going to do. And when you stay where you're supposed to stay and when you don't drive. Valid. It's true. Here's another question, Oak. This time it's from a parent and it's directed at you because they have a question about their 15-year-old. 
Oakley, my 15-year-old is always in her room. Do I just let her be? I'm scared for our relationship, and I don't know what to do. Hmm. Well, I'm guessing she's always in her room because she is probably on her phone. Oh. Oh, yeah. Wait, uh, that's what you guys do in your rooms? I mean, most likely, yeah. Okay, so she's always on her phone, which is why she's always in her room. Mm-hmm. Honestly, since I'm like a senior in high school, what I'm mostly doing in my room is homework or like talking to my friends on the phone. But yeah. So she's in her room because she wants privacy while she's on her phone. Yes. Okay. So what do you do about that? She's 15. So her whole world is her friends. Um, When do you think somebody should be alarmed that their teen is spending a ton of time alone in their room? Like what I would think it's be... like if you don't see them, like they come home from school and they just don't leave their room. Um, that's when it is alarming. Yeah. And do you have a good lead in for how you broach that? Because so many times we blow it with the way we open a conversation. I'd just be like, hey, like I feel as though you're in your room a lot as of recently. And I'm just kind of curious as to what's happening. You know, nothing. <laughs> then I would say. I don't respond to nothing. That's a great, like, I use that line all the time. No I shit. I use you that do. line all the time. I have, I have an in. Okay, what's your in? You don't seem like yourself. Yeah, that's good. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that'll get them. That'll get them. Because if there is something wrong, then they'll be like, you're right. There is something wrong. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that gets them. Okay. And even if they don't answer right away, it sort of marinates. And then they'll be like, they know. I think a big thing you could do is probably have like a family dinner designated time where everybody has to come together um i think there's also the fact that she's getting older however and so you don't want to step on her coattails too much like you want to give her a little bit of freedom but i would just in a like polite way i would just have her like have a mandatory dinner like it's an hour and a half every night that's when you guys can get together and talk so don't worry about the fact that she's in her room on her phone Mm mm-hmm is there any kind of thing to do at dinner that opens up conversation? Yeah, we we play a game called High and Low, which is in the title. You share your high of the day and your low of the day. And you just go around and you say your high and low. And that, that usually opens up conversation pretty well for us. Yeah, it really does. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what amount of gaming is normal? My son is 17, like Oakley, and is... I think playing too much games. Yeah, I think I definitely used to have a problem with gaming too much. Really? When I was younger. Yeah, for sure. Just because... Well, well, the thing with guys is that it's super common for a girl to jump on the phone and talk to her best friend for three hours. Yep. And that's not frowned upon, which is totally fine. Um, But for a guy, like guys don't really do that. But what they do do is they jump on like their Xbox or their console or their computer and they game for three hours and the guy thinks of it as the equivalent of like talking to their friend on the phone for three hours but instead of um just like talking they're like doing something in front of them as well you know dad and i used to fight about this all the time i do yeah because he would be so upset that you were spending hours on like whatever video game i'd be like dude he's not alone like he's hanging out with his friends they're on their headsets they're talking to each other while they're playing this yeah. is this is a play date yeah and it wasn't until he started to understand that this is the equivalent for you anyway of throwing the ball around kicking the soccer ball around and yeah. also the thing about gaming is most kids that play that are gaming they also do it because they're good at it yeah and it's one thing they're good at yeah it is that's what's like kind of nice about it because like you can be good at it it's easy to get good at it and like your friends are into it and when you're young and you don't have a car and you can't go out and hang out with them and you don't want to ask your parents, it's just so easy to turn it on and start talking to them and doing something else. Really? I'm saying in. like an hour or two, a weekend, if it's like three, four, like they're just talking to their friends. Like they're just trying to connect with people because they can't go anywhere else right now. And so I wouldn't worry too much. Um, but again, if it's like their whole life and they're just doing it nine to five, like I would say you should consider doing other things. Okay. So how about we plan in real time? what our family is going to do with the 14 people that are showing up over Thanksgiving here at our house. Okay. What are we doing? (laughs) 
Oh my God, I feel like so put on the spot. Um, well, I think capture the flag is always a good idea. Um, I think, I mean, we do have the, the new pool, which would be fun to do like relay races in or something along the lines of that. Um, I think we could, I mean, there's so many different like Olympic S games like cornhole or egg tosses or water balloon tosses, whatever. Um, I'm trying to think. I feel, I mean, I think that the best tradition that I like was very young for, but the lip sync battle was very, very fun. And that was one where everyone went super all out. Um, and just basically lip synced and dressed up as their each family was um a band etc and then they sang a song that was really fun what about a karaoke machine we could rent one yeah that's a no okay i feel that's, like no enthusiasm there that that's like i mean i think karaoke is fun when everyone's a bad singer but i can see that turning into kendall just taking over <laughs> Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so do we plan? So I so I, 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 I'm gleaning a couple things from you. Number one, we need costumes. Number two, we need a planned activity that everybody participates in. Number three, we need directions. And number four, we can't just let this be something that might happen. So mm -hmm. we got to know that people are rolling in Thanksgiving Day. There's going to be the feast. Uncle Tom will do his accents. We'll all laugh. We'll talk about the same stuff. And then when we wake up on Friday morning, all bets are off and it's family Olympics. Is that, is that what I'm getting? Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. I think that we need to get more creative with the games or else I think it's, it's never, or it's the worst when we come up with something and we're always really excited about it, but we've done it before. So then when we actually try to do it, it's very half-assed instead of everyone being super involved in everything. So I would advise against family Olympics just because we have already done that. But even like, like I know that a lot of our family likes to drink as does many other people in this world. Like we could do like a, like a cocktail making contest or something where everyone oh. brings their own fixings and makes like a unique drink. And we could do like, everyone could make their own drink. So like I could make one, you could make one. And then we could all like try to do that. Or we could do it based on family. Um, That's a cool idea. And since there's a couple of people that don't drink, we could force you to have to do an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic version, which is actually quite hard. Yes, absolutely. I like that as a Thanksgiving thing. That's an assignment per family. Okay, check. We got that one done. Should we have mm -hmm. a pool party? See, I think it's hard with those. Like, yes, absolutely. But I don't think it's one of those things that you can plan. Like, that just needs to happen naturally. And I think that that's the thing with making fun is it's always fun when it's not super forced. And I think it's one of those things where if you're the only one that wants to have the pool party and then you're sending out all these emails, oh, bring your bathing suit, whatever, and then people aren't really into it, then it's not fun at all. So you need to kind of like make sure a lot of people are into that. So now let me focus us on the actual Thanksgiving table, okay? How do we make that more fun? What's your hmm. opinion on adult versus kid tables? I think that having, well, an adult table, I think it's always, I think every table it's fun to like make creative handmade uh, name tags for everyone and potentially have like flowers, especially on the adult, like flowers or tree things or just make it Thanksgiving ask with that type of fall color scheme um I think having I don't I don't know like I feel like 
having little presents or little oh another thing that we used to do is we would have the poppers oh yeah I love uh, poppers that you pull like everyone holds them crisscross and you pull those those are always fun having like crowns or oh I like the idea of crown. what if we make our own crowns yeah to wear that, that would be fun or you are get assigned a crown to make for somebody else to wear at the table I like that Oh, I like that too. Let's do that. Yeah, that's a great you idea. Pull a name out of the hat and you got to make somebody a crown to wear at Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. I love that. Okay, that's done. Um, I What about a question? I was recently at a dinner party and Maxine, who was hosting the party with her husband, Andrew, asked a table of 10 people, tell us about the very first apartment you lived in. And it was kind of surprising. Everybody had a really crazy story about the very first apartment they lived in. Is there a question that we could ask all 14 family members that would bring some fun and would shake things up? Huh. That's a, I think that's a fun question, except we do have younger kids. So obviously some of us, or not me, but others haven't had their own apartment. Um maybe I don't know I always think it's hilarious to hear like people's first kiss but I know that Ooh, let's do that, that can make people uncomfortable if they haven't had their first kiss who hasn't uh, had their first kiss in her family I don't know I don't want to call anyone out but um just like younger kids um I'm trying to think like if you, oh, here's a good one. If you could plan with, if money was not an option and you, you could plan a trip for our entire family, where would we go? What would we do? That type of thing. And then everyone can go around and say that. That's fun. See, what's happening when you plan this stuff is that you're creating an environment for fun. You're creating ways for people to connect in a different manner than how we normally show up. Because I don't know about you, but, you know, even with our family of five, when all five of us are home, it's super exciting and really amazing for the first day. Mm -hmm. And then literally by the next morning, everybody's back in their old roles. Do you feel that? Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, going off of the question thing, another thing you could do is we could create like a big bowl of interesting questions with on like pieces of paper and fold them and then hand everyone one at the table or that people can like pick randomly. And so then everyone has a different random question that they can answer. Great idea. Great idea. Well, yeah, the first day is always oh, it's so great to see you. What have you been up to? And then the second day turns into either boring or I hate you all. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> no, I don't know. I just think it's always really hard to come back for the holidays with the family and it's exciting at first. And then by the end of it, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to get back to my regular routine. You're right. I, I wanted to talk to you today. Because our family gets into this rhythm when we come together where we deeply love each other. We're all excited for the first day. And then by the time the second day rolls around, everybody is in their own corners. Everybody's staring at their phones. Everybody's grouchy because they want to go see their friends instead of hanging out with us as a family. And nobody can agree on what we're going to do together. And I don't want the holidays to be like that this year. And you are mm -hmm. Miss Fun and you're super creative about this and you also get really like intense about it. And so I want you to help me figure out how to have fun as a family this year. 
Because everything that I plan, like, oh, let's go look at the exhibit at the MFA. You guys are like, I don't want to go. Or, you know, I, I used to love going to the movies on the day after Thanksgiving. I don't want to do that. Like, how, how, how is it that you get everybody to do fun things that don't want to? Well, first of all, never suggest the MFA or go to the movies. That's first off. Second, <laughs> I think that, I think that what, I agree with you and that that's exactly what happens, at least with our family and I'm sure with a lot of families out there. And I think that that's why having not like a strict schedule, but kind of like planned out things to or one thing to do every single day, whether that's okay, tomorrow we're going to definitely go on this hike and having everyone come in with that expectation that, okay, tomorrow we're going on a hike, like everyone's coming or the next day we're going to go play paddle and we've already booked the court. Like it's not, Oh, you want to do this? You want to do this? It's already planned. It's in the books. There's no canceling the following day. Like we make a bunch of um, Christmas wreaths out of all like our plants outside or trees, et cetera. But we've already cut all of the leaves or the plants so that it's all ready to go instead of just waking up and having nothing to do. And then that results to, okay, we're going to watch eight Harry Potters and drink an entire bottle of wine and be on our phones all day. You just described the holidays at our house. <laughs> oh my God. I think what you said is key that if we're going to have more fun, we have to plan to have more fun and we have to have a turnkey so that there's no opting out and there's no prep because it is the death of fun when you turn to a group of people and go, what do you guys feel like doing? Anybody want to go for a hike? And you start like teeing up options. Most people are going to go, nah, I'm going to sit here in front of the fire and look at my phone. Eh. And so I think that's right. One activity a day. Costumes are required for one of them. Bring something that's fun and creative to the dinner. And we talked about like having a, a some sort of little make crowns for every member of the family sort of thing. And so to me, that means we need to have at least the crown shape cut out for everybody. So there's no shenanigans of like everything's ready is what I'm hearing. Correct. Yeah. Everything's ready. We have the paint, we have the markers, the glitter, jewels, whatever we want people to decorate those with. And I think it's one of those things where that's all on us and you just like, that's why planning these things are fun. But if you're not into planning, then it can be frustrating and stressful. But if you like that, as I do, like I lo would love to like go to Target and get all the supplies and make the crowns and have it set up for everyone. And I think that having when other people come and they don't have to lift a finger, but they can participate, I think that that's when they have the most fun. And while that requires planning on our end as the host, it's just like, what essentially we, if we want to provide a fun environment, we need to commit to doing that. Um, and I think with costumes, the key thing is if you want everyone to go all out, obviously in the invitation, make that known, but you need to give them like two weeks, three weeks to like order the costumes, whatever. So it's not the night before and they're looking for a Santa Claus costume where they essentially just wear red leggings and a red shirt. Got it. Okay. So can I ask you to take on the crown project <laughs> yes thank you um the final thing we didn't talk about is music i think having playlists ready is critical yes absolutely one, one of the things every that i love one tradition is uh thanksgiving our family always brings the disco playlist and it goes on the second we start clearing the table for thanksgiving and there is an all hands on deck family disco dance party cleanup situation that happens. Yes, that is that is true. Very fun. Makes all the dishes way more fun. Let's talk about the transition that my daughter's going through. How can I help her cope with this massive life transition? 
So I think there's two things that you can do. Mel, the first one is I think we need to help you cope with the transition because it's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but it's a transition for you too, right? It's a big transition for you, right? It's just, it's ending at, at time she's coming home. And I heard you say things like, what's next for her, right? We all have expectations of other people in transition too. So I think first thing is just you pausing and asking yourself about your expectations of her transition. You are so good. Wow. Um, here's how I feel about it. I am very triggered by her anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that one of my kids is really uncomfortable makes me want to run and save her from it. What about her anxiety makes you feel uncomfortable? What are you saying to yourself that her anxiety makes you feel anxious? Um... That somebody that I'm that I love is in pain, mm -hmm. and I want to make it go away. Why? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Because um, it hurts my heart mm -hmm. to see her crying and sad, and because you love her. Yeah, and also there'll probably be a level of moping and annoying behavior mm -hmm. that gets aimed at my husband and I, when she's home and she's not able to tolerate like the feelings mm -hmm. and the fact that it's over and that college went like that and her fear about what comes next. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that there will be a level of discomfort mm -hmm. makes me uncomfortable. Well, but, but the, for you now, what I hear is this, you love your daughter. Yes. And her being uncomfortable, it's being translated in your brain as something is bad. True. And let's be clear, there's no transition without discomfort for anybody. She's going to have some level of discomfort that she has to tolerate and you have to tolerate. If she did in the mouth, something would be wrong. It's true. Right? So the first thing is her being uncomfortable and her anxiety don't necessarily mean something bad. Now, it can lead to something bad. Mm. But at first, I want us to really think about this as an opportunity for a new beginning right? She's closing an end and there's a natural grief that happens for everybody of letting go of the old. Yeah. And so she's going to come home with some level of discomfort. A lot of the kids coming home from college are going to have some level of discomfort. And I think the first thing the parents can do is allow discomfort to exist a little bit, maybe not going into fix right away, right? And if it gets thrown at you, like the way you're talking about, just pausing and calling it out saying, hey, listen, it looks like you're upset and you're throwing it at me and this is not my transition. Yeah. Right? Holding space from discomfort is the first thing a parent can do. Well, I think this is even bigger because if you think about it, like if you have a spouse or a partner that gets fired from a job, you're going to have somebody that you love go through discomfort. If you have a friend who, I have a friend who just lost their dad. And of course, they're going through a period of discomfort. Yeah. And we just, or at least I just want to run towards it and try to fix it and make it go away. And I think you're right. It's that I, in my brain, associate these transitions in life and these moments of emotional processing and upheaval as bad. Yeah. And so you are trying to fix it. You know, I had a friend of mine just got fired from a job after 10 years, financial industry. She just woke up one day and got fired. So she texted me. I canceled everything and said, let's go for lunch. We are sitting at lunch. And the first thing she said to me is like, you know, Luana, a week ago I was walking into work and I just wanted my ID to not go through. I wanted them to have fired me already. I was so miserable. But I just, I just didn't want to quit. It pays the bills. And so, and I looked at her and I said, we're best friends. And you never told me that level of discomfort. People are so ashamed of how they interpret discomfort they don't even share. Mm. And then she, I looked at her and I said, how are you feeling? She's like, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I paused and I looked at her. Let me call her Mary. And I said, Mary, it's okay not to be okay. And for a week, Mel, when I called her, she's like, it's okay. I said, it is not okay. You just got fired and you're the one that pays most of the bills in your house. If you're not feeling uncomfortable right now, something is wrong. And I want you to know it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to have this comfort right now. Mm -hmm. And if you run from it, you're just going to avoid the rest of your life. So the first step here in transition is to feel our feelings, right? You I don't want to feel my feelings. 
<laughs> that's I the know. thing. Like I wanted to not feel that way. Yeah, but see, that's the only way to feel more uncomfortable is not feeling our feelings. So feelings are normal, biologically wired, and we have them. Our brain tells us when we're feeling uncomfortable. And then what we do, we run, we avoid, and then we feel more uncomfortable. And the only way of actually getting through your emotions is by feeling feelings. We've seen this on kids. Look at a five-year-old in a temper tantrum, Yep. right? If you tell them, stop feeling this way, stop feeling this way, they escalate. They get so loud and obnoxious. It's true. If you sit next to a five-year-old and say, okay, so you, you're feeling frustrated. What else are you feeling? And my son will be like, I don't want to tell my emotions right now. I said, okay, so you're feeling like you don't, you don't want to feel. And I just sit there and I wait. And guess what? His emotional brain cools off. His thinking brain comes back online. And it lasts three minutes instead of 20 minutes of a fight. Hmm. So what do I do? <laughs> she gets well, off. Yeah, so I think we, I think two things we're going to oh, do. Oh, that's right. We were talking about me, not yeah. her. See how I wanted to shift this? Do you know why? I'm avoiding yes! <laughs> you. <laughs> you are making me talk about something that makes me uncomfortable. You are absolutely. I just, I just, you just wanted to run away from your emotions right now. Yes. Do you see how fast it happens, Mel? Yes. So, and we do this. That's a, one of the tactics of avoidance. We just shift the conversation. It's much safer in your podcast to talk about your daughter and her transition, her anxiety, than just sit here with, "I'm having trouble feeling my feelings right now." Yeah, I'm, I'm absorbing her transition as my own. Yeah. Wow. So I just need to feel my feelings. Yeah. And well, I need to not, uh, I need to avoid the urge to rush in and fix it. And I need to just hold space. Yeah. And let her and myself feel whatever we're going to feel. And what do you feel right now? Can we just stay with that? What does it feel like right now? Um, I feel really sad for her. Yeah. Tell me more. Oh my God. Really? Okay. Yes. <laughs> like the the tractor beam lock on uh I feel really sad for her I had a really crappy end to my college uh experience where I got extremely sick and they thought I had meningitis mm -hmm. and I experienced graduation by laying underneath a tree uh on the side and wow. I didn't get I don't even remember walking across that stage I'm not sure I was well enough Oh, so you're really sad about yourself, Mel. That's what you're really sad about. You didn't have a graduation. What makes us say that your daughter's graduation is going to be under a tree? Oh, it's not. She's singing the national anthem Whoa! in front of 18,000 people. Wait, wait. That Do bitch I... is going to be on stage. She's not going to be under some tree. She's going to be on a stage. Yeah. But see, your brain is back at your graduation. That's why you feel sad. Oh, wow. She's going to be on stage, Mel, singing. She's not under a tree. You're not feeling sad for your daughter. You're feeling sad that you, you got robbed your own graduation. That would make me sad too. I mean, seeing you under that tree right now just made my heart crunch. Like I had a little heart moment. That... Mm. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And, you know, I think I'm also just so much of your work also focuses on avoidance. Mm -hmm. And I'm very present to the fear that she feels now that school's over mm -hmm. and it's time to do the work you want to be a singer songwriter prove it mm -hmm. and I just feel worried for her of course you do your mother you love her we establish yes. the love matter so worried for her makes a lot of sense you know concern that this transition is going to be hard for a lot of kids is the first time they have to really prove themselves the first time mm. that they have to really struggle because see college has a map you do this and you do this and you do this the real life transitions don't have a map. They come with uncertainty. Uncertainty activates our brain and makes us go on fight, flight, or freeze. And that's why we want to avoid in transitions because that fear is overriding it, right? Mm. But you have the techniques to help her. It's going to be her choosing to approach every day. And it sounds like she has a clear value. She cares, and, and I'm going to put the words in her mouth, but she cares about creativity. She cares, about, oh, yeah. right? And so now she needs to create clear goals. And, you know, we're here in the studio. You have amazing systems already that you developed for yourself. You help her develop her own systems around what are the actions she's going to take every day towards that value. And 
life happens one little day at a time. You don't become on stage and become the best singer overnight, right? So she's going to have to lean towards that value every day. And what I'd say to her is this, every week on Sunday, look at your calendar for the next week. Yep. Make sure that your actions are aligned with your values. Every day, I do this every Sunday. I look, and if a day I'm not acting towards impact or family or health, which is another one for me, I'm not putting 40 pounds back on, so I need to get to the gym. And if it's not there, I rearrange my day. Because what science teaches us is that a value-driven life decreases stress, decreases depression, decreases anxiety, increases well-being. And so I bet your daughter who is now singing the national anthem, kicking ass, can create this beautiful life one little action at a time. Well, here's the irony. The lack of structure is probably exactly what she needs. There's probably a kind of a, the container has been amazing for the stage that she's in. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for her to go and create what she needs to create. That's it. That's wow, it. I just got so much out of that conversation. And I love the values as a way to anchor yourself through a transition. That's it. Wow. Because see, if, if you go through transitions and you don't have an anchor, right? I yep. love the word you use. That is a word I think about. You know, it's like the visual I share with patients is you're in a boat. It's a choppy waters, okay? And you're just going whatever the, the wind is blowing. In choppy waters, you've got to drop an anchor. And that anchor is your values. And now you decide, okay, now that I'm anchored, I know the values, then you decide which way you're going to sail in your life. But you have to have an anchor first so that you're not just blown everywhere. And your daughter is in an awesome position because it's clear to me she has the anchor. Now it's a matter of action. But values are the real anchors in life. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.